Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, firstly, if I may take a quick moment to speak to the residents of British Columbia, our thoughts go out to all of you in this incredibly challenging time. Our government is working closely with the province and our partners to provide support and will be there to help. I know my colleagues at Public Safety, National Defense and Emergency Preparedness are working around the clock and have been providing updates on the supports being mobilized and already on the move. Stay strong, we have your backs. Aussi, comme il s'agit de ma première conférence de presse officielle en tant que ministre de la Santé, je tiens tout d'abord à vous dire que c'est un honneur pour moi de pouvoir servir ainsi le Premier ministre, le gouvernement, ainsi que toutes les Canadiennes et tous les Canadiens. Passons maintenant à l'annonce d'aujourd'hui. J'ai le plaisir aujourd'hui d'être accompagné de mes collègues, les ministres Tassi, Argabra et Mendicino, ainsi que de la Dr Tam et du Dr New. Nous avons beaucoup de choses à couvrir cet après-midi. Ce matin, en commençant, suite à un examen approfondi et exhaustif de l'innocuité et de l'efficacité, Santé Canada a autorisé l'utilisation du vaccin Cormir Nati de Pfizer contre la COVID-19 chez les enfants de 5 à 11 ans. This morning, and after a thorough and comprehensive safety and efficacy review, Health Canada has authorized the use of Pfizer Comirnaty, the vaccine for children between the ages of 5 and 11. Je sais à quel point un grand nombre de parents et de familles partout à, au pays attendaient cette décision avec impatience et à quel point cette prochaine phase de la, de la campagne de vaccination au pays est importante pour nous toutes et tous. Le gouvernement fédéral travaille actuellement en étroite collaboration avec les provinces et les territoires pour coordonner la coordination et la distribution du vaccin pédiatrique à travers le pays et la ministre Tassi en aura davantage à dire là-dessus dans quelques instants. J'ajouterai de plus que 78 de la population totale du pays a reçu au moins une dose de vaccin. Je dis population totale, puisque à partir d'aujourd'hui, la population admissible augmente de, fa de façon significative. Maintenant qu'une toute nouvelle cohorte de jeunes est devenue admissible à se faire vacciner, j'encourage tous les enfants et tous les parents et les tuteurs à aider nos enfants de 5 à 11 ans à se faire vacciner, entre autres en obtenant l'information nécessaire pour se sentir à l'aise de le faire. Comme nous l'avons dit à maintes reprises, la vaccination à grande échelle en combinaison avec les mesures de santé publique individuelles est l'élément pour en finir, l'élément clé pour en finir avec la pandémie. Bien que la situation générale demeure difficile, avec une couverture vaccinale en croissance à la fois au Canada et à l'étranger, les paramètres de cette pandémie sont en train de changer, ce qui m'amène à une autre partie de l'annonce d'aujourd'hui. Early in the pandemic, we put measures into place our, at our borders to protect Canadians from COVID-19. These measures remain a key part of our overall response. And with the continued evolution of the situation, our government is announcing that as November 30th, 2021, fully vaccinated Canadian citizens, permanent residents, and persons registered under the Indian Act who take short trips outside of the country for 72 hours or less will no longer be required to complete a molecular COVID-19 test before, pre, before re-entering Canada. This change will apply to trips both by land and by air. I would also like to note that we will be reevaluating the entry requirements for American citizens coming to Canada and will provide an update on any adjustments at a later date. Furthermore, Canada is also expanding the list of vaccines that travelers may have received in order to be considered fully vaccinated for the purpose of travel to and within Canada. As of November 30th, this list will now include vaccines from Sinopharm, Sinovac, and Covaxin, matching the World Health Organization's emergency use listing. 
all vaccines approved under the emergency use listing must meet WHO standards for their quality, safety, and effectiveness. À compter du 30 novembre 2021, les citoyens canadiens, les résidents permanents et les personnes inscrites en vertu de la loi sur les Indiens qui sont entièrement vaccinés et qui font de brefs séjours de 72 heures ou moins à l'extérieur du pays n'auront plus à effectuer un test moléculaire de dépistage de la COVID-19 avant de revenir au pays. Ce changement s'appliquera aux déplacements par voie terrestre et par voie aérienne. Je voudrais aussi noter que nous réévaluerons les conditions d'entrée pour les citoyens américains qui voyagent au Canada et fourniront une mise à jour sur tout ajustement à une date ultérieure. De plus, le Canada allonge la liste des vaccins que les voyageurs peuvent avoir reçus pour être considérés comme étant, comme étant entièrement vaccinés afin de pouvoir entrer au Canada ou voyager au pays. À compter du 30 novembre, la liste des vaccins comprend maintenant les vaccins de Sinopharm et de Sinovac, de même que le vaccin Covaxin, qui figure sur la liste des vaccins autorisés pour une situation d'urgence de l'Organisation mondiale de la santé. Tous les vaccins approuvés dans le cadre du processus d'autorisation d'utilisation d'urgence de l'OMS doivent correspondre aux normes de qualité de sécurité et d'efficacité de l'OMS. Given the greater availability of these vaccines in many parts of the world, we will also be further reducing the number of entry exemptions available for adults who are not fully vaccinated. As of January 15, 2022, there will only remain a limited number of exceptions in those cases and anyone who qualifies for an exemption from vaccination will continue to be subject to entry requirements such as testing before and after entering and quarantine. We will invite soon my colleagues, Minister Mendicino, to provide more details on that. In closing, with more Canadians getting vaccinated every day, we can move forward, though cautiously, towards a more open border economy and society. At the same time, we can't let our guard down. Every one of us must work to protect the gains we have made. Winter weather is setting, setting in across the country and pushing us indoors where COVID-19 can spread more easily. Comme l'a dit la Dr. Tam et le Dr. New à plusieurs reprises, nous devons penser à ajouter des couches de protection contre la maladie. La vaccination combinée aux mesures de santé publique recommandées, comme le, corps, le, comme le port du masque, contribuera à nous protéger cet hiver alors que la pandémie se poursuit. Chose certaine, la situation relative à la COVID-19 continuera d'évoluer. À mesure qu'elle évoluera, nos représentants et nos experts poursuivront leur travail acharné et leur surveillance pour que nous soyons prêts à intervenir aux besoins. Par-dessus tout, notre priorité absolue restera toujours la santé et la sécurité de toutes et de tous. Merci. And I will now turn it over to Minister Tassi. Well, thank you, Jean-Yves. Good afternoon. Je suis heureuse d'être parmi vous aujourd'hui pour ces annonces. I look forward to working with my fellow ministers as well as officials from the Public Health Agency of Canada, and indeed alongside all Canadians, as we finish the fight against COVID-19. Our priority continues to be protecting the health and safety of Canadians, and I am proud to lead the team at Public Services and Procurement Canada. From day one, PSPC has worked around the clock, negotiating with our suppliers in a relentless push to secure deliveries of PPE, vaccines, and other goods and services urgently needed during the pandemic. The procurement approach has been proactive and aggressive. As part of the largest vaccination effort in this country's history, contracts have been established with foresight and careful negotiation so that we receive vaccines as soon as they receive Health Canada authorization. And because of those early agreements, Canada secured access 
to more than enough doses to vaccinate all Canadians. And now, just over 85% of Canadians 12 and older are fully vaccinated. Getting your vaccination is still the best way to protect yourself. Most of us have gotten the vaccine, not just to protect ourselves, but to protect others. This morning, we heard the good news that Health Canada has authorized Pfizer-BioNTech's COVID-19 vaccine for children between the ages of 5 and 11. As we announced last month, Canada and Pfizer agreed to an accelerated delivery schedule for the COVID-19 vaccine for children once it received regulatory authorization. With the authorization announced today, I can now confirm that Canada will begin receiving doses Sunday with all the 2.9 million doses received by the end of next week. Avec l'autorisation annoncée aujourd'hui, je peux confirmer que le Canada recevra ses premières doses dimanche prochain et le reste des 2.9 millions de doses initiales durant la même semaine. That's enough doses to offer a first shot to all eligible children in this country, giving added protection to young Canadians. We are working closely with Pfizer to firm up the exact schedule for delivery of the second doses, and we will have more information to share about that soon. Getting vaccines for us and for our children remains crucial. We know that Canadians still face extremely challenging conditions created by surges in COVID-19 infections. For the doctors, nurses, and frontline healthcare workers, and for all Canadians, our government continues to be vigilant in providing the vital supplies needed to stay safe and to save lives. As the Minister of Public Services and Procurement, I can tell you that we are redoubling our efforts to protect Canadians and to finish the fight against COVID-19. Thank you, miigwech, merci. Minister Mendicino, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Bon après-midi. I'm pleased to be speaking with you virtually from the traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. And as my colleague, Minister Duclos, just previewed, we are here today to tell you about a number of adjustments which we are making at the border and with regards to the public health measures. Depuis le début de la pandémie, notre gouvernement a pris les mesures nécessaires pour assurer la sécurité des Canadiens dans un contexte de pandémie mondiale. Nous commençons maintenant à voir la lumière au bout du tunnel. I want to thank Canadians who have stepped up and are following public health guidance and have gotten vaccinated. For those who are eligible but are not yet vaccinated, we urge you to get your shots as quickly as possible. We know this is the best way for our country to return to normal. With the support of scientific evidence and advice from our public health experts, we can announce that starting on November the 30th, if you are a fully vaccinated Canadian citizen, permanent resident, or a person registered under the Indian Act, you can re-enter Canada within 72 hours of leaving the country without having to take a COVID-19 molecular test. Let me be clear. Travelers who are outside of Canada for more than 72 hours will still need to present proof of a negative COVID-19 molecular test result taken 72 hours or less before arriving in Canada. Canadians taking short trips of less than 72 hours outside of Canada will be able to return to Canada without having to take a molecular test. Travelers will have to enter their travel information in ArriveCan and will be responsible for maintaining proof of the 72-hour period to show airline, rail companies and government officials at the border as required. Remember that providing false information to a Government of Canada official upon entry to Canada is a serious offence and may result in severe penalties 
or even criminal charges. This new rule does not apply to foreign nationals, including international students and foreign workers residing in Canada. They will still be required to provide proof of a negative COVID-19 molecular test result, regardless of the length of time outside of Canada. Also, given the wide availability of vaccines, we are reducing the number of exemptions for adults who can currently travel to Canada without being fully vaccinated. As of January 15th, 2022, some groups of travellers who are currently exempt from entry requirements will only be allowed to enter the country if they are fully vaccinated with one of our approved vaccines. These groups include individuals travelling to reunite with the family, excluding unvaccinated children 18 years old or younger, professional and amateur athletes, international students over 18 years old, most temporary foreign workers, and essential service providers and cross-border essential workers, including truck drivers. I strongly urge all travellers, Canadian and foreign nationals, to verify all entry requirements before they travel to ensure they meet all mandatory requirements. And that can be done easily by visiting the travel.gc.ca website. En raison des changements que nous annonçons aujourd'hui, certains voyageurs pourraient connaître des retards à la frontière. Les agences des services frontaliers ne vont pas compromettre la santé et la sécurité des Canadiens pour réduire le temps d'attente à la frontière. Je demande donc aux voyageurs de collaborer et de faire preuve de patience. I would also like to remind all travelers that they must submit their mandatory information, including their digital proof of vaccination, in ArriveCan no more than 72 hours before arriving in Canada. ArriveCan is free and accessible by logging into the website or downloading the app. I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge the work that the Canada Border Services Agency officers are doing to protect Canadians while continuing to facilitate the movement of travellers and goods in support of our economy. La priorité absolue du gouvernement du Canada demeure la santé et la sécurité de tous les Canadiens. Nous surveillons la situation de la santé publique au Canada et dans le monde et nous allons continuer d'adapter aux besoins les mesures de santé et à la frontière. Now, let me say a few concluding words about the situation in British Columbia. The flooding situation in the lower mainland of British Columbia has caused significant difficulties and disruption in moving goods domestically within Canada and to and from the BC Lower Mainland. Special interim measures are being set up to facilitate the movement of commercial goods. These interim measures are largely intended for Canadian domestic truck carriers that do not normally cross the border in the course of their business. Any Canadian carriers that currently operate between the United States and Canada, as well as domestically, are encouraged to follow the standard procedures. This will facilitate crossing and decrease delays at the border that will be caused by these temporary special measures. And my colleague, Minister Al Gabra, may have more to say about that. Most importantly, however, our thoughts go out to all of the British Columbians who have been impacted by the significant devastation that has been caused by the extreme weather, including the floods. Uh, we will continue to provide whatever support that is necessary and to be there to have their backs at this very difficult time. And with that, now I will pass over the mic to Minister Al Gabra. Merci. Thank you very much, um, Minister Medicino. Hello, everyone. Bonjour à tous. I also want to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered today on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. 
I also would like to say a few words about the situation in British Columbia. We are in constant communication with the provincial government and our partners to ensure the safety of people, the supply of goods, and the maintenance of infrastructure. I am very relieved uh, to, to, uh, to uh, re-announce what Minister Mendicino just said, that we've reached an interim agreement with the U.S. for Canadian truck drivers. And I want to take a moment to, to thank uh, Mr. Medicino, his team, CBSA, and uh, our friends down uh, in the U.S. for reaching this agreement. I've spoken this morning with Minister Fleming, my British Columbian counterpart, to update him on latest developments and to hear from him about the work that he's doing. Regarding today's announcement, I've said it before. Vaccination is one of our best tools to finish the fight against COVID-19. Le vaccin sont notre meilleur outil contre la COVID-19. That's why on October 30th, we implemented firm travel requirements that include mandatory vaccination in order to board planes and trains. If you aren't fully vaccinated, Oh. For example, oh, this is the wrong page. I should turn this. All right. We also continue to work with industry, the U.S., public health, and key stakeholders to develop requirements for a safe restart to the cruise industry in 2022. We knew that some people would need more time to become fully vaccinated. That's why, for a very short period until November 29th, unvaccinated travelers may still show proof of a valid COVID-19 PCR test in order to board. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone, this transition period is quickly coming to an end. If you, have, if you aren't fully vaccinated by the end of November, you will not be allowed to board a flight departing from a Canadian airport, nor will you be able to board a Via Rail or Rocky Mountaineer train. And starting November 30th, there will be very few exemptions to allow unvaccinated travelers to travel. Il y aura très peu d'exceptions après le 30 novembre. For example, one of the rare ex exceptions is medical inability to be vaccinated. Travelers who think they may be eligible for medical exemptions should contact their airline or rail company to obtain the necessary form and submit it. And to receive an exemption, travelers will need to submit a temporary exemption form signed by a licensed medical doctor or nurse practitioner to the operator. Exempted travelers will also need a valid negative COVID-19 molecular test result before boarding. And I want to be clear, false claims could be subject to Transport Canada fines. Operators must also report to Transport Canada all some such exemptions granted. In recognition of the unique needs of remote communities, the vaccination requirement will continue to include specific accommodations for travelers to and from remote communities. This will ensure they are able to obtain essential services in support of their medical, health, or social well-being. These robust mandatory vaccination measures will continue to help protect the health and safety of all Canadians. I also want to say that we are looking at the next steps in reopening our airports. We are working closely with CBSA, PHAC, and airport partners to determine when and which airports can be reopened. And I hope to have some more news to share soon. In conclusion, I also would like 
to take this opportunity to say thank you. Je voudrais dire merci. Thank you to the Canadians who have rolled up their sleeves, to employees in the transportation sector, and to all the transportation operators across Canada. By requiring travelers and employees to be vaccinated, we are helping to keep everyone safe and to help finish the fight against COVID-19. Merci, thank you, and now we're ready to take your questions. Thank you. We will now open the floor to questions. Merci. Nous passons maintenant à la période de questions. To give everyone a chance to participate, please limit yourself to one question, one follow-up. And we ask that you begin your question by identifying yourself and naming the media outlet you represent. Alors, afin de donner la chance à tous les gens de participer aujourd'hui, uh, veuillez, s'il vous plaît, vous limiter à une question et un suivi. Et veuillez, s'il vous plaît, commencer votre question en vous identifiant et nommant l'organisme de presse que vous représentez. We'll begin with questions in the room. Uh, good afternoon, Ministers. David Aiken, Global News. I think this is from Minister Duclo, but if there's some uh, others that want to uh, contribute, please do. Um, an individual presents himself at the border. That individual is fully vaccinated and has no symptoms and is otherwise healthy and is a Canadian. So come on in with no test. Oh, they're an American. You present a higher risk because you're American and not Canadian. Can someone point to the scientific evidence that says that a fully vaccinated American is somehow more dangerous to our public health than a fully vaccinated Canadian? Why a test just because you're American and no test because you're Canadian? Can you explain the, the science behind that? Well, well thank you, uh, David, and I hope you hear me well. And I'll answer briefly your question and then turn to uh, Dr. New or Dr. Tam for the for more evidence based on 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 health and science. First, the rules for uh, vaccinated Canadians and uh, vaccinated Americans when they come to Canada for long stays are identical. They need to be vaccinated, and they need to show a pre-departure negative test. Now, what the rule what, what the rule is being changed today is for vaccinated Canadian travelers that are going to the United States for a short amount of time, that is for 72 hours or less. That's the only change which is uh, applied to those that are being, that are vaccinated, be they Canadians or foreigners. And on the, the reasons, the health reasons for that, I'll turn to Dr. New or Dr. Tam. It's Dr. New, Dr. Tam, I'm sure you just got reconnected. Did you hear the question? Yes, I think so. Okay. So I think um, some of it is not as much the science as it is the operational consideration is how I understand it. So if a American traveler comes into Canada, I believe they have a right to stay for six months, uh, for example. And there is no way that we can actually follow them up in terms of the return or the length of their trip. And um, so, so it's working out those, um, I think, operational considerations. For a Canadian, there are systems in place that we can track uh, in terms of someone leaving Canada and coming back in. And, uh, but we are continuing to explore those uh, phased, saved and fa phased approach to easing those measures. It's Dr. New. Maybe I, I can just add to what Dr. Tam said. I think uh, the question, the way it was posed, was you know it was based on nationality. Of course, it's uh, you know from a risk management perspective, it's not uh, uh, the nationality. It's really the epidemiology. So, as we said uh, um, numerous times before, we're closely watching the epidemiological situation both in Canada as well as the U.S. as well as uh, obviously uh, other countries around the world. Uh, we know it's been an, uh, an irritant along the, the border in terms of the border communities, which are very highly integrated. And I would say that uh, for the most part, uh, the epidemiology might be uh, somewhat similar between, let's say, uh, border communities on either side of the border. And so uh, you, you can see that uh, from a risk management perspective, it makes sense, let's say, if a Canadian uh, wants to go across for a quick shopping trip in the U.S., you know, maybe a... Uh, 
you know, get some uh, cheap gas or whatever, uh, uh, that, that it makes sense that, you know, uh, if they obviously to hopefully take all the other good uh, public health precautions are fully vaccinated, that uh, the actual risk uh, for, for themselves, as well as obviously uh, uh, when they come back to Canada is, is pretty minimal. And certainly that's, that's part of the thinking. However, you were just talking about Americans in general coming to Canada. Uh, you, you can see it. There's still lots of hotspots in the United States, and we have no idea uh, what the, the, you know any given individual, regardless of nationality, what they've been doing, or what you know what the community or what situation they're coming from. And so that's why I think uh, uh, we're 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 looking at it very, uh, I think, carefully. Uh, obviously, as Dr. Tam said, in a phased approach, uh, uh, prudently taking it step by step. And uh, certainly, one part of the uh, uh, sort of analysis is uh, continuing to look at the epidemiological situation in both countries. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, and just uh, this is probably Mr. Duclo as well, or the doctors. So we have these three new vaccines sort of added to our list. I wonder if somebody could speak to why now? Was there some new research, new findings that supported adding those vaccines? And knowing that they are WHO approved, and maybe just give us a sense uh, to Canadians who say, well, is that sort of some good standard, anything we need to be uh, worried about from a public health standpoint. So why the three vaccines now, and can you speak to the process by which those vaccines were approved by an external authority? That's an excellent question. So both on standards and processes, I'll turn immediately to Dr. Dr. Tam. Yes, so um, right now, uh, as um, the minister and others have said that we're, we've, we're taking a phased approach to the easing of border measures. And I think um, scoping in these three additional vaccines that's aligned with the WHO emergency use list is one of the next phasing. It would uh, have us see more travelers, I believe, who would then come in. And uh, we wanted to be absolutely certain that the epidemiologic situation in Canada supports further entries of travelers. Um, I do think that travelers uh, taking these vaccines uh, fully vaccinated have a reduced risk. But we also mitigate that risk by still requiring uh, the pre-departure test, and, um, but, but there's no quarantine requirements uh, after the individuals come in. We will continue to monitor the situation as it pertains to the vaccinated travelers using these additional vaccines, uh, using our mandatory random testing approach, that methodology as someone arrives. So these individuals will still be subject to a random test so that we can do some surveillance and monitor uh, what this group of travelers is like in terms of the test positivity as they come through the border and we can adjust um, uh, our measures accordingly. But what I will tell you is that based on the data that we've received in the last several months, the test positive rate in vaccinated travelers who've been vaccinated with these additional vaccines is really no different based on what we see now with the data compared to the travelers who are fully vaccinated with the Health Canada approved vaccines. So all of that is very reassuring. And the bottom line is that there has to be also a way to benchmark and standardize international uh, vaccine standards as it pertains to travel. So even though these vaccines are not authorized in Canada because they've gone through the WHO process in terms of evaluation of safety, of effect efficacy and of um, quality, uh, we've taken that into account as we uh, increase the list of vaccines uh, for Canadian border measures. We've also recommended that individuals who receive the non-Health Canada authorized vaccines may be offered an extra dose of mRNA vaccine in Canada should they be staying in Canada for any length of time. Uh, with that, that uh, potentially also reduces any risk that these vaccines may have a lower vaccine effectiveness, which we have seen in some of the data around the world. Uh, but we felt that to be a very acceptable approach and it's supported by the Chief Medical Officer of uh, Health across Canada. Thank you. Next question. Oui, bonjour, Lina Dib, La Presse canadienne. Ce serait pour euh, Monsieur Duclos, et si jamais vous n'avez pas la réponse, peut-être la ministre Tassi. Euh, vous disiez que les... Euh, 
Les premiers vaccins pour les enfants vont arriver dimanche. Québec espère commencer à vacciner dès la semaine prochaine. Ils ont besoin de 700 000 doses. Savez-vous euh, à quel moment le Québec pourra mettre la main sur les premières doses pour vacciner euh, euh, les enfants québécois? Bien, merci pour la question. Et comme vous l'avez dit, ça va faire faire très rapidement. Ils arrivent au pays dimanche, euh, évidemment en, en, en étape. Et les prévisions, c'est que d'ici la fin de la semaine, ces doses soient déjà livrées à l'ensemble des provinces, dont le Québec. Alors, j'ai parlé euh, au ministre Dubé il y a quelques jours à peine là-dessus. Et on est totalement coordonné et on a entièrement confiance que tout va bien se passer. Le Québec, en particulier, a fait un travail préparatoire euh, d'appoint et, et solide. Et on a très confiance que d'ici la fin de la semaine prochaine, euh, le déploiement des vaccins et l'administration de ces vaccins pour les, vac pour les enfants se fasse très bien. Euh, Dr Tam, je crois, nous a dit qu'il y aurait éventuellement une campagne pour encourager euh, les parents canadiens à faire vacciner leurs enfants. Est-ce que vous avez des détails sur cette campagne-là? Est-ce euh, que ce serait une campagne fédérale? À partir de quand ça commencerait? Et puis, je me demandais aussi les exemptions, les exceptions. Là, euh, pourquoi attendre jusqu'au 15 janvier pour les faire disparaître, étant donné que les vaccins sont déjà disponibles depuis, euh, depuis longtemps? Dr. Tan, vous voulez euh, Non, non, c'était pour euh, le ministre du Clos. Oh, excuse. <rire> ah, ben, je... vous, excusez, voulez-vous que je recommence Vous écoutiez plus là. <rire> ah, ben, je me réjouissais de la question et j'attendais la réponse avec plaisir, mais là, je m'aperçois que c'est à moi que que vous sollicitiez une réponse. Alors, si vous voulez euh, recommencer pour être sûr que je réponde à tous vos éléments. La raison pour laquelle je l'ai nommée, c'est parce qu'elle en a parlé ce matin à sa conférence de presse, Dr ah. Tam. Alors, donc, elle nous dit qu'il y aura une campagne pour convaincre les parents de faire vacciner leurs enfants parce qu'on sait qu'il y a une certaine résistance. Je me demandais si vous aviez des détails sur cette campagne-là. Est-ce que ce serait une campagne fédérale? Quand est-ce que ça commencerait? Quelle allure ça prendrait? Et puis, une autre question qui était aussi à vous. Pourquoi est-ce que les exceptions euh, qu'on lève, on les lève seulement le 15 janvier et pas avant, étant donné que ça fait quand même un certain temps que les vaccins sont disponibles? Si c'est ça le raisonnement, on les lève parce que les vaccins sont disponibles. Merci. Très bien. Alors, deux questions et, et deux réponses. Premièrement, pour la campagne, oui, il va y en avoir une, une campagne fédérale. Au cours des derniers mois, là, on a développé une excellente expertise à l'Agence de santé publique pour partager l'information et encourager, pas forcer, mais encourager les gens à faire le bon choix. Et on sait que les provinces, dont le Québec, vont faire la même chose. Et la deuxième question, donc, au sujet de pourquoi le 15 janvier, c'est parce qu'on veut que ces, ces mesures soit évidemment suivi de comportements euh, adaptés aux annonces. Donc, on sait que ça prend un certain temps pour les gens euh, qui voudraient venir au Canada après le 15 janvier à se faire vacciner. On sait qu'il faut, dans la plupart des cas, deux doses. Donc, les étudiants étrangers, par exemple, ou les personnes qui voudraient euh, revoir les familles au Canada qui ne sont pas présentement vaccinées en dehors du pays, eh bien comprennent là, que si ces gens-là veulent venir au Canada après le 15 janvier, bien, ils ont à peu près deux mois pour se faire vacciner. Thank you. Next question. Hi, Mike Blanchfield, Canadian Press. Um, I guess this is for the health side of this uh, briefing. Um, how, uh, how are you going to deal with vaccine hesitancy in parents? That's an excellent question. I can speak at a high level first, and then uh, Dr. Tam can uh, provide some further uh, guidance. First, at a high level, I think Canadians over the last uh, almost a year now, since we first uh, administered the uh, dose of uh, of uh, uh, vaccine against COVID-19 in, uh, in January 2021, I think Canadians have appreciated and endorse the, the value of our uh, regulatory process in Canada. Um, Experts knew before then that we had, we had in Canada one of the best uh, regulatory system to approve uh, vaccines and other, uh, and other medical uh, equipment and supplies. And they now know that uh, that level of external confidence is, is being supported by the extraordinary success that we have had in Canada, thanks to our experts and scientists, but also thanks, obviously, to the hard work of millions of, of Canadians. 
So in that context, I think the the um, the, the reception that today's news uh, will generate is going to be solid. I think most Canadians, most families uh, will uh, will feel confident, and they will feel confident in large part because this is a decision made on the basis of science and for the reasons, the scientific reasons for which the science is supporting that that uh, that approval by health canada i would briefly turn to dr tam there are some uh, very good indicators that this vaccine is both safe and efficient and efficacious for uh, treating and protecting children and their families yes well thank you for the question and um, i think it is normal for parents to have questions and that we need to be able to answer them in order to uh, facilitate the decision to get the kids vaccinated. I think that um, Canadians uh, have been waiting for this vaccine. In our public opinion research, in fact, uh, over 50% of parents would want to get the uh, 5 to 11 year olds vaccinated straight away. Um, about a quarter of them are waiting to have more information, which we have provided more of today. Uh, while some parents uh, still not have not decided to vaccinate the kids. So that's already a good start. And I do believe that um, having Health Canada undergone the rigorous process uh, of authorizing vaccines, including reviewing their safety, their efficacy, as well as their quality, gives people a lot of reassurances. We've been through this process many times now with the vaccines approved for the older age groups, the adults and the adolescents, and that we've seen what a successful vaccination program we can have. I think the data today that we saw and being re-examined by the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, that's our group of experts, our guiders as well, has recommended that um, the vaccine be uh, maybe offered to children five to 11 years old, again, having and a thorough review of the evidence, and also having an expert review of the dose interval, which they reckon to be recommended to be eight weeks uh, or more, in order to um, increase the immune response, uh, uh, getting a stronger immune response, and more longer lasting immune response is what might happen uh, given the experience in the adults as well as there's a possibility that that increase interval may reduce um, side effects such as myocarditis, which hasn't been reported uh, to date through the clinical trials. So, so I think parents can be reassured that so far the vaccines have no safety signals and that they're efficacious. The clinical trials have shown that it's 90.7% uh, vaccine uh, effective, uh, eff efficacy. So that's really amazing, is in line with all the other vaccine uh, results that we've seen using uh, these mRNA vaccines. But having the facts are uh, not necessarily enough. I mean, children, I think, um, many ha have been through a lot during this pandemic. We need to take into account the mental and physical state. We need to talk to kids about vaccines. And there's many tools that we're uh, providing so that parents can have a conversation with the kids about getting vaccines. We have many tools to reduce anxiety in children. Some of them are invented in Canada um, that calms children down and provide them with information that they need to get vaccinated. But I think one of the most important things that we're doing at the moment is empowering health professional um, groups, including pediatricians. Of course, pediatricians, one of the most trusted voices when it comes to parents and kids getting vaccinated and they're being provided with the information get credible information from, from the Canadian Pediatric Society, for example. That's really important. But parents are, of course, influenced by social media, by other kinds of media. So as Minister Duclos had already alluded to, there will be campaigns on television, both ethnic and um, other channels, radio, again, through indigenous radio channels, ethnic media, digital billboards, as well as digital and social media platforms that are targeted towards parents and voices and trusted voices that the parents uh, hook up to. So it's going to be a big um, escalation of efforts from all levels of government, um, not just the federal, but uh, the provincial, territorial, local, as well as health professional organizations. 
So what is a acceptable level of vaccine hesitancy in your view, given everything that we've been through, as you've just said, and given that there's been a strong anti-vax movement among children's vaccines before this pandemic, how are you going to combat that? Well, as I said, it's not using one method, but multiple methods, and particularly leaning on trusted voices, which are not necessarily, you know, Dr. Neil and myself, but many of the other trusted voices in the community, as well as in uh, the health professional groups. I have to say that let's remind ourselves that for a slightly older age group, the 12 to 17 year olds, they've done a, a remarkable job. There's been a very high vaccine uptake in that group. In fact, all age groups in Canada have achieved over 80% fully uh, vaccination status. So those adolescents we can look to as um, inspiration. They've got the vaccines. Their parents are supported to get the vaccines. Now we've got another chance with a uh, younger group of kids, but we've already had great successes. I'm very confident that our vaccine program will continue on this front. But nonetheless, we have to provide the specific information that parents of a younger group of children will need for their decision making. Uh, but um, I, I don't know that there's a very specific level of acceptability, but I am, uh, of course, championing uh, the can Canadians to get vaccinated and reach for the stars in terms of vaccine coverage. But I think um, you will see many parents getting their kids vaccinated. And if they communicate that out to other parents, that's often how other parents will get their child vaccinated. So parents and kids who uh, receive the first vaccines, if they communicate out their experiences, other parents uh, would really appreciate that and will help the other children uh, get vaccinated as well. I think also enabling schools, teachers, educators to have some information that they need uh, should uh, kids ask them questions about vaccines. But I am very optimistic that, um, that we will be able to address the questions that parents uh, are going to ask us and that we have a good safety and surveillance system to monitor the effects and impacts of the program. Thank you. We'll now move to questions on the phone. Operator, la parole est à vous. Thank you. Merci. La première question est de Marie Kay Walsh de Global Mail. First question, Marie Kay Walsh, Global Mail. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Votre ligne est ouverte. Hi, Minister. Thanks for taking our questions. My first question is for Minister Duclos. I'm just uh, so confused. Can you please explain what evidence and scientific advice the government is using to decide to not follow the advice of its expert panel and maintain the requirement for a PCR test for most fully vaccinated travelers? Where is this health advice coming from and what is the health advice that justifies it? Thank you very much. Uh, let me limit my answers to uh, three different things, and then perhaps Dr. Tam will want to complete uh, the uh, the response. First, the obviously the advice of the expert panel is an important has been, and the expert panel and panels will continue to provide important advice to the government. This being said, public health uh, agency takes into account many other uh, sources of, of guidance and in particular follows the situation very closely as indicators change and as the situation changes. And as we know, the, the second thing is that the situation has changed over the last weeks and months with the Delta variant and, uh, and with no uh, increasingly, I, I believe, visible signs of pressure on our health system. Now, in addition to that, uh, the, the third thing that I, I would say is that uh, there will be you know, further um, looks at the situation as we proceed gradually and with significant vigilance. This is an ongoing process. We need to be always mindful of the health and safety uh, of Canadians. And that includes the fact that although COVID-19 in Canada is not perfectly under control. We are in a better situation than in most other places in Canada. Uh, per capita, for instance, in the United States, 
their rate of new COVID cases is four times the rate of the COVID cases that we see, uh, new COVID cases that we see in Canada. In the UK per capita, it's 10 times uh, the number of new cases that we see uh, every day in, in the country. And in the United States, again, as a proportion of the population, they have twice the number of non-vaccinated people than we have in Canada. So all of these circumstances uh, lead the agency to be uh, yes, pr proceeding uh, and uh, evolving with time, but always be prudent and vigilant when it comes to protecting the health and safety of Canadians. Dr. Tan? Yes, thank you for the question. And I think uh, the expert panel recommendations came at a certain point in time. And as the minister to close said, things change quite rapidly with um, this pandemic and our understanding both of the virus and the vaccine. So the Delta variant is a formidable beast, is a, is a virus that is very highly transmissible. Fortunately, the vaccine is still very effective against the Delta variant, including mostly, particularly against the severe outcomes such as hospitalization and death, which is great news. But we also have learned that the vaccines are not perfect in terms of reducing infections and whether it's mild or asymptomatic infections and that vaccinated individuals, although they're at a reduced risk of getting infection, could get infected. And when they do get infected, they could actually have um, similar viral loads to those who are unvaccinated. So there is a reduced risk in those who are vaccinated, but if they do get infected, they can potentially transmit to others. So all of this evolving knowledge came between the recommendation of the panel and our current time. As Minister close that we are taking a cautious phased approach to lifting layers of border measures. We are definitely not out of the woods. The pandemic is very much alive all over the world and including in Canada, where we are, as I've said, we'll expect some turbulence ahead in terms of the epidemiologic curve with some provinces now in experiencing an increase while others are now calming down. But our health system is fragile, and we've just seen Alberta, Saskatchewan, and, and the Western provinces and the territories trying to cope with um, the increases in uh, cases and impact on the hospital. So now's not the time to let go all our guards down, but it is important for us to take a thoughtful approach in reducing those layers. So we do have our own border testing uh, results as well, and so we'll be monitoring that over time. And as you've just uh, probably appreciated, we're also adding additional vaccines from, uh, or that, that will be um, added to the list of uh, full, fully vaccinated definition. And with that, that's another change. And so we would, uh, we really advise that we keep that test for now and evaluate things as we go along. That pre-departure test, if someone is positive, we expect that we'll probably, um, detect about 70%, 70% of positive travelers ahead of them boarding a plane if we took that test within the 72 hour time frame, And so that is a important layer of protection. Just to point out that with the United States, they are still requiring a pre-departure test for, um, for um, air travel, for an instance. So they haven't let go. This is, this is not something that's different. Many, many countries have a pre-departure test still in place. And um, so, so I think, um, but we are committed to revisiting these policies as we're going along. Follow up? Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, the panel's recommendations might have come at a point in time, but at that point in time, the government also didn't act on the recommendations. And the U.S. testing requirement, I believe, is a much cheaper and easier test than Canada's. But so I don't know if anybody wants to address those, but I do have to clarify two things, I believe, with Mr. Mendocino with the time I have. Um, first of all, on, on the vaccination requirements that are coming in in January for professional amateur athletes, does that mean there will no longer be vaccination exemptions for athletes in the NBA or in the NHL or any other pro sports team? And will the vaccine requirement for travelers now apply to five to 11 year olds? And if it will, when will that come into effect? 
I'll take the uh, first part of your uh, question and uh, very simply put the answer is yes. So as of January 15th, um, there will no longer be an exemption uh, in place uh, for professional and amateur athletes. And with regards to the second part of your uh, question, I will um, yield the floor back over to Minister Duclo as it relates to five to 11 year olds. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Minister Mendicino. And I'll turn <laughs> almost immediately to uh, Minister Argabra, just by saying that today's focus is on vaccinating children, not between the ages of on five and, and 12. And that's why we are so pleased and so proud to be able to work with provinces and territories in putting that uh, um, forward. We know that's going to help children, not only from a health perspective, as Dr. Tam said, but also from a social school a perspective as well, a sports perspective, because we know how dire the situations can be for families and children when a child uh, becomes infected by the uh, by the disease. Now, there is, in my understanding, no intent uh, to change the um, transportation rules around the ages of uh, 5 to 12, but uh, for that to be um, perhaps a better uh, asserted, I'll turn to, to uh, Minister Algabra. Uh, thank you, Minister Duclos. Um, and uh, you are right that there are no uh, changes currently to the man vaccine mandate for travelers. Uh, our priority right now is to ensure that uh, the supply of vaccine for kids is available, distributed to provinces and administered as quickly as possible. Uh, and as uh, the vaccines become more widespread, as more uh, children become vaccinated, we will reassess that policy. But for now, there will be no changes. Thanks. Thank you. Operator, next question. Thank you. Merci. Next question is from Cormac McSweeney, CD News. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Votre ligne est ouverte. Hi, yes. I was just uh, hoping to follow up on something that uh, Marika was just asking about in terms of uh, vaccinations for kids age 5 to 11. So you say things could change in terms of domestic travel and travel in general. What about coming back into Canada? There are currently restrictions on children who are traveling with fully vaccinated parents um, are we looking at making some changes to the age groups there in terms of those quarantine restrictions uh, for coming back into Canada for uh, kids once we have more 5 to 11-year-olds fully vaccinated? Well, well, thank you. We're not making any changes now, but uh, as we said uh, all along, no, obviously we will follow the situation as the public health agency has also repeated. That will always be based on, on the evidence that we're gathering over time. Follow up? Yeah, um, I also want to follow up on something that was uh, asked a little bit earlier in terms of dealing with hesitant parents to get their children vaccinated. Um, in, as a part of your campaign to parents, because uh, there are a lot of parents who were more willing uh, as adults to get the shot but are more hesitant with their children, are you going to be micro-targeting uh, these parents in terms of region if you see some provinces like maybe the prairie provinces or more rural areas where there's more hesitancy? Are you going to try and you know, micro-target your ad campaigns and your push to get more of these younger children vaccinated? Well, this is an excellent uh, point, and, um, and um, I look forward to Dr. Tam explaining in further details how the agency has already started to do that with significant success and how it may want to apply uh, exactly those techniques to the uh, forthcoming vaccination for children. Dr. Dan? Yes, I think um, the campaigns, but also the education of health professionals and communities have to happen at every level. So it's not just the federal government working on their own. But we've been supporting community-based organizations, supporting uh, trusted voices such as Black Canadian voices, physicians, trusted voices from the perspective of pediatricians. So they will be working at the ground level because they know their populations and their patients best. So that while we can do certain amount of focus targeting for certain populations, we are leveraging the capacity of other groups and organizations that we've already leveraged. Uh, some of it is done through our uh, funding 
like the Immunization Partnership Funds and others, is just help support on the ground organizations who are going to be doing that work where we cannot have the reach, but they will. So that kind of work will continue. And as, Dr., uh, as Minister Ducour said, that's been very successful to date. Uh, and we would be happy to continue to support those targeted approaches. But we've seen lots of innovation in the Canadian vaccination uh, campaigns at every level. I mean, I can still remember all those incredible campaigns all across the country, whether it's Toronto or in Quebec or in British Columbia or elsewhere. Uh, there are parts of the country that are still unvaccinated. We do know that parents who are unvaccinated it's probably uh, going to be quite difficult to convince them that their kids need to be vaccinated. And, and we will continue to work with that uh, population as well. Thank you. Operator, next question. Thank you. Merci. La prochaine question. The next question is from Milan Kreit, La Presse. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Votre ligne est ouverte. Oui, bonjour. Uh, ma question serait pour uh, probablement uh, le Dr. Tam ou le Dr. New. Euh, je me demandais, euh, avec la vaccination des enfants de 5 à 11 ans, euh, cela pourrait porter à combien la proportion de personnes vaccinées au pays? Euh, ça, c'est Dr. New. Pour répondre à votre question, notre estimé pour la population, la, 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 la population admissible maintenant des enfants entre euh, 5 et 11, c'est euh, c'est environ 2,9 millions. Euh, donc, euh, c est, c est, c est, c est, on, on commence avec ça pour euh, offrir une, une première dose aux, aux enfants. Et puis après, euh, c'est sûr, on va aussi euh, planifier pour une deuxième dose. Mais euh, comme proportion, 2,9 millions et la population du Canada, c'est euh, un peu plus de 38 millions de, de Canadiens. Suivi. Est-ce que vous savez en termes de pourcentage, euh, est-ce que vous savez en termes de pourcentage, ça porterait euh, la vaccination des citoyens canadiens euh, au Canada à, à combien? Est-ce que vous, vous avez ce chiffre-là? Euh, je parle des chiffres euh, euh, avec moi <rire> maintenant, mais euh, je peux vous dire que la, la proportion des enfants en, en total moins de, de, de 12 ans, euh, ce, que, ce que je me rappelle bien, c'est... Euh, environ 4,8 millions. Donc, donc c'est comme un pourcentage de la population totale. Moi, je ne pas faire les, 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 les calculs rapidement dans ma tête, mais la population, 38 millions de Canadiens. Donc, ça, c'est... Je ne veux pas dire quelque chose maintenant parce que je n'ai pas mon, mon calculatrice avec moi, mais à part de ça, pour, les, pour la population de, des enfants 5 à 11, je pense que, comme on a déjà... C'est 2,9 millions de, 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 de petits enfants entre les âges de 5 à 11. So, C'est un bon, bon, bon pourcentage. C'est important aussi parce qu'on a dit toujours que uh, chaque... Uh, personne qui, euh, qui est entièrement vacciné, c'est notre couche de protection. On sait que c'est important pour les adultes. On, on encourage encore toujours l'adoption des vaccins parmi les adultes et aussi des adolescents. Mais euh, je sais, on, on sait toujours que c'est très important pour les parents euh, d'être de, de, confiants pour leurs enfants, parce que les enfants, vraiment, les, les enfants 5 ans, c'est précieux. C'est notre futur, notre avenir, et c'est sûr que, euh, comme on dit, le, le, euh, il faut être absolument you know, confiant avec la, la sécurité et aussi l'efficacité des vaccins. Donc, euh, jusqu'à date, euh, le Santé Canada, avec l'approbation, euh, c'est vraiment bon, une bonne nouvelle pour euh, avoir un vaccin approuvé. Et maintenant, avec les recommandations de, de notre communauté consultative nationale d'immunisation, c'est une autre, une autre bonne signe qu'avec les données probantes, l'analyse avec les experts, on, 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 on dit qu'on peut offrir le, le vaccin. Et on sait que, comme Dr. Dam a déjà constaté, la euh, majorité, je pense que plus que la moitié des parents, sont prêts à, à, à se faire vacciner leurs enfants tout de suite. Quand, quand les vaccins soient disponibles. Et maintenant, je, on sait qu'il y a aussi peut-être un quart de, de, de la population euh, des parents qui peut-être veut peut-être euh, avoir plus de renseignements. Donc, c'est très important pour nous autres à l'échelle fédérale, mais aussi pour les euh, provinces et territoires de, de donner, de fournir les, les bons renseignements. Euh, je pense qu'un bon moyen, euh, comme on, on a déjà constaté, c'est euh, 
euh, travailler étroitement avec les, les spécialistes, les pédiatres, les, 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 les fournisseurs de soins de santé sur le train, parce que c'est vraiment eux qui ont, 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 ont comme dit, beaucoup de crédibilité avec les parents. Donc, c'est les, les, les prochains efforts. On continue à, 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 à dérouler avec les, les verres de, de campagne, excusez-moi, de publicité. Et euh, je commence que, euh, ça commence aujourd'hui. Si je peux ajouter un petit brin de, de mon input, là, moi, je suis, j'ai pas la chance d'être médecin, mais étant économiste, j'aime beaucoup les chiffres. Donc, Mme Crête, si vous voulez faire un calcul rapide, il y a, il y a à peu près 5 millions d'adultes, euh, en fait, d'adultes de, de 12 ans et plus là, qui, qui ne sont toujours pas vaccinés euh, pleinement au pays. Et, et en plus de ces 5 millions, bien, à peu près, comme disait le Dr. New, il y a à peu près 5 millions euh, d'enfants de 12 ans et moins qui ne n'ont pas pu être vaccinés jusqu'à maintenant, à peu près 3 millions entre 5 et 12 ans et euh, un peu moins de 2 millions en bas de, de 5 ans. Donc, sur un total de 10 millions de Canadiens qui ne sont pas présentement vaccinés, 5 millions d'adultes, et là, il y a 3 millions de ces Canadiens, donc 3 millions entre 5 et 12 ans, qui deviennent admissibles à la vaccination. Et on pense que ça va aller assez rapidement. Fait que, comme vous pouvez constater, là, on devrait euh, assez vite euh, améliorer considérablement le taux de vaccination de la population totale euh, au pays. Merci. Et... Et Peut-être seulement un, un point final pour ajouter à ce que le ministre Duclos a, a dit, que c'est toujours aussi important de souligner le point que les vaccins, c'est vraiment, vraiment important, mais ce n'est pas la seule solution. Hein. C'est toujours important parce qu'aucun vaccin est 100 efficace. C'est important de souligner l'importance des autres, des autres mesures de, 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 de protection individuelle, aussi de la santé publique, le port de masque et aussi, aussi en, 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 en rassemblement, peut-être à l'intérieur, peut-être l'importance de ventilation. Toutes les autres mesures, on commence encore à parler parce qu'avec le L'arrivée de, de l'hiver aussi, les fêtes, c'est très important de souligner des autres couches de protection à part de, des vaccins. Merci. Thank you. Minister Mendicino needs to leave us, and we have time for one more question. Um, nous avons la table une dernière question. You no, know, go ahead. It's for Minister Mendicino. Yeah. No, I'll, go ahead. Yeah, just, we just come back from Washington, and I know both our countries want to have healthy vaccinated travelers come into the countries. Can you give us a sense of the discussions you had to maybe harmonize the public health protocols at the border agencies, technologies and stuff like that? Can you give me a sense of where Canada and the U.S. are and making it easier for travelers to understand what they got to do health-wise to cross the border? Well, the first thing I want to say is how important and productive this uh, summit was. It was the first opportunity for the leaders of our three countries, Canada, the United States and Mexico, to meet in this forum uh, since 2016. Uh, to be able to meet with our counterparts uh, in person in Washington, D.C., allowed us to strengthen the relationship, which is already deep and abiding, on a number of important priorities, including fighting the pandemic, looking at ways to strengthen the supply chains so that we can continue to get as many people as possible vaccinated because we know that the science tells us that that is the best way to finish the fight when it comes to the pandemic. Um, with regards to uh, a number of other areas uh, that we were able to um, uh, continue that collaboration, we talked about fighting climate change. Uh, we talked about uh, the ways in which we can uh, create economic growth uh, that is inclusive. And we talked about the ways in which that we can cooperate at the border. And here I had an opportunity to meet uh, with my American counterpart, Secretary Mayorkas, uh, where uh, we thoroughly uh, canvassed a number of priorities, uh, including ongoing cooperation with regards to uh, border health uh, care measures and protocols. We also uh, talked about the ways in which we can um, ensure that there's integrity and security at the border. And so on an array of priorities, uh, what I will say, David, is that um, there is a strong degree of collaboration around uh, public health care protocols that has allowed us to manage the risks when it comes to the pandemic. And certainly going forward, we expect that will be the same. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes today's event. Merci. Ceci conclut l'événement d'aujourd'hui.